never one of us. You were nothing but a usurper, a false idol. Your honor and duty are nothing. You suffer in silence. You will die for their sins. The Ancient Gods Part 1 was a bloodbath, and I loved it. Doom Eternal's first post-launch campaign delivered some incredibly fun, albeit difficult, challenges alongside twists and turns that sent the Doom speculation scene into overdrive. Hype surrounding Part 2 was off the charts, and after months of near silence, enduring Hugo drip-feeding us information week by week with nothing to show for it, we were finally graced with a trailer, and with it news of when we would finally get our greasy fingertips on the impending campaign. TOMORROW?! Alright, right off the bat, let's start with the music, because that was a big topic in my last video and I feel like I should address it here before it's too late. Part 2's soundtrack is a huge step up from Part 1, once again helmed by David Levy and Andrew Holschult, and oh boy, if you were upset that he only got a couple of tracks in Part 1, then you're in for a treat. Andrew Holschult composed well over half of the OST this time around. A big complaint that I had last time was the overabundance of monotone gent focused on for many of the songs, and I'm happy to say that nearly every track in Part 2 addresses this concern, as if someone saw my video and specifically tailored the soundtrack to fit this criteria that I said. I'm not taking credit, it's just an interesting coincidence. The gent is often accompanied by a melody, or the gent itself is complex enough to be the melody. Yeah, we've got the metal choir back. I'm not sure if these are the same samples used for mix work, at least when it comes to Holschultz compositions, but man, even though he's only got a couple of tracks here, David Levy once again delivers my favorite track of the campaign. A track so intensely doom-feeling that I think it comes close to rivaling my favorite piece from Mick, The Only Thing They Fear Is You. My god, do you hear that double bass pedal? There are very few ways to my heart, and one of those ways is with a double bass pedal. There is one more track I want to bring up, but as you might guess, it's for the final boss, so I will hold my thoughts until we get there. But before we get started on the campaign, there are a couple of points I want to bring up, and once again, neither of them are the invasion mode, God damn it! I, I know these things take time, I'm not going to be upset that it's delayed, just... Man, the title screen music has been changed to a piece by David Levy, and let it be known, I think that this piece is fine. And if this was the title screen piece that we had for the entire game up to this point, I wouldn't even mind in the slightest. It is, however, the precedent of it that really bothers me. I hope that this change is more to reflect the current state of the game, because my initial impressions upon hearing this was one of concern. That this might be the beginning of id Software wiping and replacing Mick Gordon's work from the game after his departure, implying more tracks later on would be replaced by David Levy, which god, I can only hope that that is not the case. That would just be pouring gasoline onto a still burning fire. Ancient Gods 1 got nerfed. Some folks were pretty upset about this, including myself at first. The opening areas of UAC Atlantica were made significantly easier, and you know what they say, first impressions are everything, so it felt fair to say that the shift in difficulty was true for the entire campaign. But y'all can rest easy knowing that this is only a minor nerf in terms of pacing, and most of the difficulty here is still intact. According to Hugo, this was all done to address balancing and pacing concerns, and after beating it once again, I can say with certainty that the campaign is mostly untouched, and there are little reasons reasons to get upset over such minute changes. Some of them I think were actively good changes, like introducing a spirit to you with a Hell Knight instead of a Baron. Seriously, whose idea was that? At the point of recording this voiceover, Hugo has said that they are reverting the balancing changes back, which I'm not totally sure how I feel about. Alright, well like before, let's boot the game up into Nightmare and... 
Okay, alright, this is new. A good addition for newcomers to the series, and I think it brings more good than bad to the series. But this screen pops up every time you want to start a new file, including Ultra Nightmare attempts, which can be a bit tiresome over time. Oh, yeah, if you're expecting some Ultra Nightmare rants for Part 2 akin to Part 1, I'm sorry to disappoint. I finished Ultra Nightmare on Ancient Gods Part 2 on my very first try. Equate that to Part 1 where it took me almost a week of non-stop trial and error to secure that Ultra Nightmare victory. That alone should speak volumes to how much easier Part 2 is than Part 1. We open the campaign the way that I'm sure most of us expected, continuing right as Doomguy returns the Dark Lord into physical form and greets our malevolent doppelganger the only way Doomguy knows how. Could you imagine if that worked? First impressions led me to believe that it was the Dark Lord who disintegrated the SSG Blast, but for reasons I'll go into in a bit, I think that this is a side effect of the Luminarium, a holy place where no blood can be spilled. I mean, he flinches when he gets shot at. He totally expected to die right there. No blood. The Dark Lord, surprisingly civil given the situation, says their battle will come, and he'll be waiting for the Slayer in the capital of Hell, Imora. Bring on the title drop! Alright, I'm on the record saying that this riff was by Holschult in the last video. It's not, it's David Levy. A lot of you corrected me on that. And now that I've educated myself a bit on their work, yeah, I could totally hear that this is indeed not Holschult. That's my bad. Seems like Vega isn't at all upset over us beating Samuel to a near pulp despite our transgressions. He's still giving us a hand in our journey, guiding us to Argent Denur to alert the remaining sentinels of our mission, and gaining passage to the World Spear, a massive sentinel crystal embedded itself in the planet, and ground zeros for the sentinel's advanced technologies, as warriors would be granted fragments of the crystals if they were deemed worthy by the Wraith's guardians. That's right, we've got some Wraith lore here. Those same alleged godlike beings that were enslaved by hell to produce Argent energy in the well. Also so yeah, I'm going to be calling the father Vega, because this will get really confusing later on if I keep calling him the father, just go with it. And right away, the gameplay sets the tone for us. Where part 1 opened with an onslaught of heavy demons, part 2 is easing us in a bit slower, with only a couple of fodder demons and a cybermancubus, able to be easily killed with an SSG blood punch. No ice bomb required like I previously thought, but for now, it's just your basic platforming, but with one incredible new addition. I can't believe it took them this long to think of grapple points, but I'm happy to see them here. Using one doesn't immediately put your meat hook into cooldown either, so as long as it's just between these grapple points, you can chain these grapples back to back pretty swiftly. You just can't reuse a point until you touch the ground again. It's fair enough to me. Oh, come on, I know there's supposed to be an ambush here once I pick up this armor. What's going on? Come on out, you bastards! Alright, so I planned to take out the shield guys with the destroyer beam after I hit the pain elemental with the arbalist, but the splash damage took care of them for me. Oops. And then we're on to our first true arena of part 2, with a brand new friend to add to our bestiary. Screechers, a modified fodder demon that acts as a buff totem upon taking lethal damage, and I love these guys. They act as a bit of a difficulty slider for more experienced players and an obstacle for less experienced players. Where some might try to avoid the extra punishment and avoid triggering the Screechers, I like to activate them on purpose, giving me some extra challenge, at least when it comes to this opening level. And this philosophy of scalable difficulty is something that we'll be touching on more as we continue. Their buffs are more of a middle ground between buff totems and spirits, probably why the color purple was chosen, don't you love color theory? Where screech demons can't be faltered or frozen like spirits, but can still have their weak points blasted off. And to wrap this guy up in a nice little demonic bow, their buffs aren't permanent, so if you really wanted to, you can play this game of keep away while you wait for their buffs to wear off. Ah, looks like the wolf trials return. Freeing the ectoplasm pupper from his cage is the easy part. It's the wolf arenas themselves you need to worry about. But honestly, I didn't mind. It's just a few fodder demons and a buff totem. The most dangerous demon here is a juiced up hell knight, and only if you don't see him coming. And if that trial rubbed you the wrong way, you can take your anger out on these pinkies that are once again lined up ceremoniously with these blood punch recharges. You ever wanted to see the bastard child of a marauder and a baron? 
armored barons, fitted with a mace capable of destroying flesh and soul alike, according to the Codex. The Marauder comparison is a bit of a stretch, it's really the green flash that sells that feeling. It's practically a baron with an extra layer of protection, that once that extra layer is broken off, either with brute force or a timed precision bolt to the mace, it becomes a regular baron again, though only for a moment. Imagine if a cyber mancubus was able to regenerate its armor after being blasted off. That's exactly what's going on here with the cyber baron. I'm gonna call him the cyber baron, I hope you don't mind. You only get a short window to deal legitimate damage, and I think that this is a fun change, and like its armor, adds a nice layer to the combat. Also, cooking their armor with the microwave beam just feels incredibly satisfying. The way that it gets all red hot makes me feel like that lava guy from Iron Man 3. Gideon, Million, I, I don't remember. Looks like Empowered Demons got a nerf as well, dropping only a fraction of the ammo we were used to. Honestly, I'm mixed with this approach. I figured having a harder demon reward you with an ammo refill was a good trade-off, but it's not the end of the world. This arena with the Hell Knights over the Toxic Sludge here made me really nervous in earlier playthroughs. I would hesitate to use the lock-on burst out of fear of triggering the Screechers, but no, I was just overthinking it. Even triggering the Screechers, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, come on, I know that there's supposed to be a Mancubus here. Is there another one of these things? Really? Again? Oh great Mountain Dew Dog, show me your wisdom. That is shit wisdom. Yeah, I hope you like the purple goo, because it's back in full force, though this is the worst case of it in the campaign in my opinion. You can, however, meat hook jump out of the goo to render it practically moot, so that's nice. I still lost a life in this arena though, so I'll give it that. Uh... Detecting an energy signature from Commander Valen. Wait, Commander Valen? The Betrayer? It's been a minute since we've seen that guy. I, I was hoping they'd bring him back. He tells us that his son's soul is at peace and he's atoned for his sins. And I guess as a gift for freeing his son's soul from the Icon of Sin, he awards us with his trusty sentinel hammer, the Hellbreaker. Which I admit comes out of nowhere, but fuck it, it's, it's awesome. Also, the name Hellbreaker I think was only used in the trailer for Tag 2, so I'm not sure if that's the canon name. Take the Hellbreaker. May it serve you well. Though Valen is talking to us a lot like King Novik did back in the base campaign, appearing almost as a specter of himself. I thought that this meant that King Novik was dead and talking to us through a manifestation of his soul, but Valen is still alive. So through this single interaction here, I'm left wondering what the hell is King Novik doing and where is he? But anyway, yeah, here's the hammer. And it's absolutely busted. As you could probably guess, this thing was the reason I was able to clear Ultra Nightmare on my first try. And I hope it won't be that way for long. Charges are replenished through glory kills or destroying enemy weak points. Points, full stop. There is no difference between a glory kill on a fodder demon or a tyrant. Glory kills as a whole recharge your hammer, alongside only needing to break two weak points to recharge. So you can easily grind a full hammer charge off of a single revenant or mancubus. That's probably why the first demons you see after picking it up are our favorite skeleton friends. But what does it do? It is a full stun AoE, faltering every demon nearby for enough time for you to get out of whatever pickle you might be in, and can be comboed with the Flame Belcher Ice Bomb to replenish armor and health points respectively. If used as intended, this can keep you alive through the roughest arenas. Now, I will give the game benefit of the doubt. I've been playing practically nothing but Doom Eternal for the past year, so maybe I just picked up this mechanic really quick, and I found the best usage for it faster than the casual player. That's totally possible, and I need to keep reminding myself that this game isn't exclusively meant for me. Doom is for everybody. But as you'll see later, I kind of find it hard to imagine that they didn't expect players to heavily rely on this thing. Spirit or Screech demons seem to be the only affected demons that seem to be truly immune to its stun, though still dropping ammo. Oh yeah, this thing also drops ammo from every demon affected by the hammer. They don't even need to be killed, just in range. This thing is a long-range chainsaw and ice bomb rolled into one weapon. However, Spirit and Screech demons cannot be faltered, so these demons pose as a counter to a hammer-reliant playstyle. The thing is, Spirit demons can be shredded into atoms by merely a few rocket volumes. Oh, that never gets old. Oh, but you know what does get old? 
Stone imps. Rejuvenated imps born from the volcanic pits of hell, with a hide as tough as stone, which is a lore-relevant way of saying that they're near immune to practically all of your weapons, but are distinctly weak to the auto shotgun mod. Yeah, this is a not-so-transparent attempt from the devs to make the auto shotgun used more. Now, I've become a little bit of an auto shotgun apologist, more specifically the instant salvo mastery perk when it comes to fodder demons, but I feel like there could have been a better way to handle this. The codex says only intense vibrations can pierce its hide, but isn't getting peppered by bullets in general a good way to cause said intense vibrations? They still glory kill the same and instantly break when caught in the sentinel hammer's range. They also homing attack around the place with a very distinct sound. The Sonic joke has been done to death, but honestly, it's deserved. And if you played this in an earlier build, they blow your fucking ears out upon being glory killed. This alongside getting instantly jibbed when hit with the chain gun's energy shield. Not just killed, but fucking jibbed. This has been patched out of the game though, sadly. I recorded my playthrough of part 2 for reviewing purposes in the middle of the game receiving its first balancing update. So this is the only footage I've got of this shield bash quick kill, sadly. Doomguy approaches the Torch of Kings, a beacon meant to rally the forces of Argent Anur that's been inoperative since the Makers turned to the demons, so a really, really long time. Looks like the Sentinels here got a facelift too. That's pretty nice, though it's not the last instance we'll see of content being reused from Doom 2016's multiplayer. Doomguy lights the Torch of Kings, signaling to the remaining tribes of Argent Anur of his mission, essentially a call to arms against the remaining forces of Hell, and that he seeks passage to the World Spear. And who else to be our chauffeur than a goddamn Skyrim Dragon. Hello, Todd. All of this just works. Ah, I miss the snow. It's been a minute since we've had a snowy setting in Doom. And you know what else we haven't seen in a minute? Mandatory gore nests. Gore nests were relegated to optional encounters in Doom Eternal, but here in Tag 2, at least for the moment, they're back to what they were in 2016. Pop the heart pimple and slaughter some demons to get a move on. But as you might guess, there is a bit more to it. Upon completing these escalations, what the game calls these gore nest encounters, you're awarded with an upgrade for your sentinel hammer, a mandatory upgrade for the hammer. And yet the gore nest still remains, offering players additional challenges if they so desire, building off that scalable difficulty that I described earlier, and I... I love this. I wish the rewards were more than simply cosmetics, but the fact that the challenge exists here in the first place is fantastic. They are required for level completion, so if you're going for 100%, it's not like these rewards are for naught, and these Gornest rematches are easily some of my favorite arenas in the campaign, topping this one off with multiple archviles and doom hunters. It's fun. <laughs> turrets are back from part 1, which I admit I was not very thrilled about, but they've been balanced in a way that I think was a pretty good call. The eye now remains exposed for a short couple seconds before retreating back into the pillar, now giving you enough time to quick swap between the precision bolt and the ballista, making that sticky grenade trick a thing of the past. A nice change if you ask me. Wait, a blood maker? Aren't makers not able to move outside of Erdak? Is what I thought to myself, completely forgetting that maker elites coexist in Sentinel Prime? That's just a mistake on my part. It's the maker drones that can't leave Erdak. So we know that if we see any of those fuckers around here, then something's definitely wrong. Anyways, blood makers have become a relatively non-threat to me. Just prep your microwave beam and that'll stun them as soon as they're vulnerable, giving you more control over hitting them in the head. Sometimes it just completely negates their armor altogether, which I haven't found a reliable answer to, so there's a chance that this could be a bug, but hey, I won't look a gift glory kill in the mouth. Or through the mouth. The pacing in this arena is a little awkward, though. Bloodmakers spawn one after another, making me think that these guys spawn endlessly, which isn't the case at all. It just felt a little misleading. He is worthy. I don't care how cheesy this whole moment is, I fucking love it. God, look at that view. The Doom Slayer as small as he is compared to the scale of the history of this place. It's all beautifully effective storytelling. Doom Guy approaches the entrance to the World Spear covered in eyes which might suggest a higher omniscient all-seeing entity above what we've all seen. And this thing is spouting out energy off the charts, more than what we've seen from Erdek. If you ask me, I think that it's these orange crystals inside the World Spear. Those things can tear a hole through anything. I, I joke, but remember how Hell only needs 
needed three wraiths to create a near endless supply of Argent energy for their cause? Yeah, those aren't scales you're seeing on the walls. Those are more wraiths. Upon obtaining the sentinel crystals seemingly watched over by other seraphs for some reason, the intern locks in a location, the Gate of Devoom, the only known portal to the capital of Hell, which, get this, is back on Earth in the possession of the UAC. Codexes say it was Vega, as the father, who created the Gate of Devoom, leading a lot of people to wonder why it's on Earth in the first place. But I think that this is just a case of sentient and Hell technology falling into the hands of the UAC. Nothing too surprising here. Looks like the Slayer has also become an icon to the world, with people taking his mark and turning it into one of hope and inspiration that the battle against Hell will one day be over. Oh no. Cursed Prowlers, seemingly a green recolor of the Prowler demons at first blush. And assuming that you don't get hit by them, that's really all he is. The Cursed Prowler drips necrotic magic from its claws, where the only way to lift its curse is to destroy the caster. Which is a lore way of saying that if you get hit by him, you're in for a hell of a ride. Try not to panic, I know that it's very easy to set your sights immediately on the Prowler as soon as you're tagged, but be sure to stock up on armor, health, or possibly even ammo if you're in this situation. Doomguy is unable to dash or lock onto the Prowler with any lock-on weapons when he's in this state, and the Prowler becomes invulnerable to every weapon in your arsenal, minus the Blood Punch. Meaning once you're hit, this turns into the most awkward game of tag that you've ever played in your life. However, the Prowler becomes a lot slower to compensate as soon as you're cursed and you can still meat hook onto other nearby demons, so you just gotta play it a bit smart. This does not mean that I love the bastard, though. I think that he needs some serious balancing going forward. Keep the consequence of not being able to lock onto him, so I can't cheese the fucker, but maybe make him spirit levels of resistant to weapons rather than purely immune, with blood punches being an instant kill to reward you for getting in close, but having other methods to fall back on. I think that there are good ideas here, but I'm not happy with this execution. At least he makes a noise now when he spawns. He didn't do that when the expansion first released. And yeah, by now you've probably put it together that every new demon introduced in part 2 is a variation of an already existing demon, which people have been visibly divided on. I personally don't mind and welcome this approach to new demons though. While I probably would have given the Screecher a unique model and maybe add some rougher bump maps to the stone imps to give him that rocky look, this is ultimately a fine model. Mostly. Oh, hey, it's the Gauze Cannon! Nice to see that get a bit of love outside of 2016, albeit only in concept art form. We also see the BFG container and some unused demon concept art. Made me think of the carcasses concept art. Have you seen that thing? Looks like a completely different monster at one point. Power restored. Wait, do I get to punch the train?! Uh oh. Yep, the chain gunners are back. I, along with many others, lost our collective shits when we saw this guy show up on the store page, which made it all the more saddening that he's a pathetic glass cannon of a fodder demon. Now, you could argue that the chain gunners were glass cannons in the original Doom 2 when compared to the rest of the demons, but when put side by side with his hit scanner brethren, he was definitely the meanest of the three and always a high priority, rising to popularity from expansions like Plutonia, which yes, I will cover one day, please keep asking me. But these guys are arguably the weakest of the gunner fodder demons with their added weakness to explosions, being instantly staggered by a sticky grenade or just straight up jibbed by a remote rocket. Now, this isn't exactly a bad thing. Their indestructible shield add another layer to the combat in a way that I think fits and can certainly be a nuisance if they're chilling behind some heavier demons. It's the legacy of the original demon that I feel is diminished here, turning one of the most iconically infuriating enemies into explosion fodder. Well that was lame. This gore nest is a treat too. Not only is the arena a ton of fun to navigate around, but it's the first time that we see a marauder in the campaign. For context, this is the second mission of part 2 where part 1 had 4 marauders alone in its opening level. It's clear that part 2 was intended to be more innocuous than part 1, but as long as the optional challenge still exists for more experienced players, then I haven't got a problem with it. Anyways, right, the marauder. Yeah, the Marauder gets absolutely dismantled by the Sentinel Hammer, extending his falter long enough to let you one-cycle him with nothing but SSG Ballista swapping. I hope you anti-Marauder folks are rejoicing with this one. And yeah, you hear that dazed sound effect he makes now? That's across the entire game, not just DLC Part 2. And personally, I think that this is a great addition. 
Yes, it is very cartoony, but this series sort of always has been, even the serious one. But even from a practical point of view, this cue is telling players exactly how much time you have to punish the Marauder, which will be great for first time players. I don't care if you think it's cartoony, this is gonna make the journey easier for incoming players, and I think that's pretty great. And as if the hammer couldn't get any more overpowered, this gore nest grants your sentinel hammer with higher armor and health drops from burning and frozen enemies when struck with the hammer. God damn. I don't have a ton to comment on regarding the optional second wave. There is an arch vial that I like to save my BFG for, and a spirit hell knight can be a surprise, but aside from that, there's not really much to say aside from it being a fun time. Ah, look at all those hammer charges. Well, don't mind if I do. Okay, well I will say this, I did not exactly miss these swimming sections. These ones are harmless, thankfully, only taking you from one arena to the next, with nothing but a hammer charge if you really need it, which I typically don't. And hey, no oxygen meter this time. Some of you pointed out that part one's oxygen meter was less of an oxygen meter and more so for the ocean pressure when he's in deep waters. And hey, that makes sense. Hey, do you guys remember the Unmaker? This Turbo Pinky is the only time in the game that I find myself voluntarily using the Unmaker in part 2, which is a big shame. Remember how exciting it was to see this at the time obscure piece of Doom lore hit the mainstream? Ever since they patched out the Unmaker Overdrive, I just haven't found the same use for it, which is sad because now the BFG is just infinitely more useful than the Unmaker, where I only really save it for tanky spirits, kind of like Samuel's Pain Elemental. Shortly after this Turbo Pinky though, us fellow Codex enjoyers got a massive truth bomb dropped on us. The revelation that the Dark Lord, Davoth, was the true father all along, the first being and creator. And Jakkad, also known as Hell, was the first realm connected to all others. Davoth, wanting the best for his people, vowed to make the people of Amora immortal. Oh, now I get it, Amora immortal, nice. In his search, he created the Maker Race, acting as seekers to find the secrets of immortality. But upon learning that mortal flesh could not bind to an undying soul, the Makers partook in a coup, declaring the true father a threat to free life and stealing his powers of creation and title, imbuing it in the father's first creation, Vega, who took up the mantle of the father and created Erdak, as well as the Conmaker, who had no knowledge of the original father. Though while Davoth was sealed away and his title and powers stripped from him, he still had influence over the physical realm, nudging the universe towards his own agenda. He convinced then Seraphim Samur that a chosen one would come to them to usurp the Khan, and left behind a fragment of his own being to be used in the Maker's divinity machine, giving rise to the Doom Slayer after many died in the process, all orchestrated by the Dark Lord as a plot of revenge against the Makers who betrayed him. Though I guess he didn't foresee the Slayer being such a powerful force that he'd end up destroying his own legions of hell in the process. Oops. I mentioned in my last video that I believed the events leading up to the Doom Slayer's rise, from his birth to the events of Doom 1 and so on, were all orchestrated by the Dark Lord as a way to demonstrate how great his influence really was. But literally days ago from writing this, Hugo Martin shot this theory down in an interview with Tyler McVicker. Oops. You know, he didn't make Devoth. I mean, he didn't make Doomguy. Like, Doomguy was born, and not, not by the hand of the Dark Lord. The Dark Lord simply exposed what was already there. But that, that really doesn't make sense. If the Dark Lord did not have hands in the Doomguy's birth, then A, why do they look the same? I guess that'll be established later. But B, they make a big deal about how mortal men can't just simply become immortal. So how come the Divinity Machine worked with him? They're implying that there's something else at play here, and I don't know if we'll ever know. WHY AREN'T YOU BALD?! This tiny arena here, assuming that you're not stocked up on BFG cells, can really kiss my ass. It's a lot like that tiny arena near the end of part 1. With all the Dread Knights and Spectre Whiplashes, it's a tight enclosed space with a lot of pressure demons that, when buffed, can deliver a lot of punishment. I've got the hang of it now, but this was the closest an arena came to ending my Ultra Nightmare run. And it's even more brutal once you realize that the glowing purple screecher effect is invisible to these whiplashes. Cool. That, that was just embarrassing. I'm sorry, man. I'll let you live after that. The level tops off with another pretty solid arena, bringing back that familiar UAC facility aesthetic that we've stuck with and come to expect from the series, with a lot of verticality to it as well. Again, there's not really much I can comment on about the arena itself, but it's certainly a highlight. And that's about how I would describe Reclaimed Earth as a mission. A bit more of the same, but done very well. The Slayer approaches the Gate of Devoom, activating it with the Sentinel Crystal from the World Spear, turning out to be one of the more violent slip gates we've seen in the series, fitting given the context.
Man, you know, if you think about it, the Slayer standing in front of the capital of hell like this, we're literally at Hell's Gate right now. This sequence is incredible. Davoth's got his own Praetor suit, albeit compensating for his mortality, calling his demons into actions in a way that beautifully reminds me of the opening of Doom 64, which given Hugo's attachment to the game wouldn't be surprising if this was an inspiration for this moment. When all of the sudden, BAM, fucking Valen shows up with an entire army of Night Sentinels, mechs, and dragons in a moment that feels ripped out of Avengers Endgame and I'm not complaining even in the slightest. I'm not even gonna question how the hell Valen and his men were able to stir up a slipgate to Amora after all the work I had to put in for it. This sequence is just too good and incredibly rewarding for players who have stuck around with the lore for as long as I have, even though they kind of seem to be neglecting it. Oh no. Come, brothers! Let hell tremble before our might! I have goosebumps. Oh, you thought the spectacle was just for the cutscenes? Fuck no! This shit lasts nearly the entire level. Massive Atlan Titans taking on enslaved Hell Titans. Endless hordes of Hell Soldiers clashing with Sentinel Soldiers. Yes, that is the Doom 2016 multiplayer lightning gun, and yes, that is a UAC gun, which doesn't make sense, but fuck you! I love everything about this, mostly. We'll get there. The Gore Nest is probably the most underwhelming moment of the level, which really says a lot. I thought it was a fun challenge, sure, but like Reclaimed Earth, I don't really know what to call comment on, other than, hey, there's maker drones here. Us codex enjoyers already know why that is, but for folks ignoring the codexes, this is a pretty subtle hint towards hell being the first realm now that the Khan is slain. Jesus Christ, extended days? All right, this is getting a bit ridiculous. I'm sorry, what? Leave me alone, Dread Knight! I'm trying to watch the kaiju battle! Go for the rocket kick! Yeah! This is the greatest day of my life. I take it back. Torch's face off! Oh, what is this? A catapult? Do I get to fire it this time? Oh, wait, don't tell me. Yeah! Yeah, sure looks like maker tech to me. Really makes you think about all of that lore we just read, doesn't it? Ah, oh, well, that's a demonic citadel if I've ever seen one. I'd wager that's where the Dark Lord is waiting for us. Oh, oh no. Demonic troopers. The only truly new demon with a big asterisk at the end of demon. Now, if you're like me, you instantly checked the codex before mowing these guys down. And from here, they sound pretty threatening. They cannot be glory killed and cannot be chainsawed. That sounds good for an enemy near the end that you can't grind resources off of. But they have practically no health, able to be killed with the slightest output of damage. Even the meat hook alone is enough to make them pop. And yes, they are carrying the Reaper from Doom 2016 multiplayer, which has led me to dub the city of Amora Recycle City. Ironic for being the first realm in Doom canon. All aboard the boom tube! Oh, what's this? Double Marauders? You know I have the hammer, right? Ah, now there's a big boy. Fuck it, I want to fight you at your best. Yeah, hurt me more, snake. There you are, you big red motherfucker. I'm coming for you in your funny mech suit. This is the final big arena of part two. A bit short, but a lot of fun. I like to save my BFG blast for the moment that the cursed prowler appears. You know, for how much people hate this guy, he only appears about four times in the entire campaign. It's also kind of weird that the arena caps off with a cyber baron and not the spirit baron. Why not a spirit cyber baron? I don't care if that would fuck up his weak point. I want to fight the juiced robo man. Yo, is he going to ride the ship or... Oh. I am so happy. What the fuck was that sound? Well, 
All right, I'm gonna be honest. I'm not sure how I feel about this being the final arena right before the final boss of Doom Eternal. It's enjoyable, but it's just a marathon of stone imps and a near endless supply of shotgun ammo. It's kind of confusing. This is something that belongs in the World Spear level, shortly after meeting the stone imps, not in the capital of hell right before the devil fight. It just leaves a sour taste in my mouth as we head into the final boss. As the Slayer approaches the Dark Lord's chamber, he loses connection with the intern, leaving him as he was when he started his demon slaying adventure alone and with his own thoughts. But you know who isn't alone? Davoth. I'm not sure if he's in cahoots with these ancient gods as the subtitle puts it. First off, I thought these were seraphs, and second, I thought Davoth and Vega were supposed to be the campaign's namesake, but okay. Anyways, hi dad. You bring violence and war to thwarts of the Dark Realm, but conflict was born in hell. It is inevitable. A fire that fuels creation and gives purpose where there is none. Okay, but did they consent to that purpose? Being used as a living battery is purpose, sure, but is it ethical? All right, I take it back. He's got a cool suit. The Dark Lord is here! The Slayer comes face to face with the very being responsible for all of his rage. The Mars base, Daisy, his alleged family, all separated from him by the deity in front of him, in a fight spanning across dimensions and possibly even time. More on that in a minute. Yep, he's a super marauder, and I love it. Now look, I'll be the first to admit that concluding the end of the Slayer saga with essentially a beefed up marauder, the most controversial demon added to the game, is gonna turn some heads. But if you know me, you'll know that I love the marauder and what he brings to the Doom formula. And I think that it just so happens to be that the way that I personally play Doom Eternal feels like the playstyle that the Dark Lord was balanced for. Now, that is not an excuse for the fact that you can beat the first phase of this boss fight without even moving. But it also meant that when I heard people didn't like this fight, I was genuinely surprised. At first, when you're ready to attack, you need to stand close enough for him to pull his sword out, but not too close that you get hit. And at that point, you need to be on your toes for that green flash. Hitting him makes him vulnerable for about as long as a marauder would be stunned for, which of course can be extended with a sentinel hammer, which can be recharged by these wolves he sends out, or by the infinitely respawning fodder demons around the edges of the map, meaning that you really don't have an excuse to be out of hammer charges unless you just used it. And that's how I personally play. If I know that I can get a resource back after using it, my first thought is to replenish said resource. He even uses some of the game's logic against you, dropping his own health charges whenever you get hit that he absorbs. He is literally framed here as your doppelganger. Or I suppose you're his doppelganger, I don't know, it's, it's complicated. Okay, this is the time part that I mentioned. We all know that the hell invasion was stopped on Earth, so what is this then? Is it a nightmare projection, or are we going back in time? Regardless, it's pretty fucking cool. I feel like I'm in a battle that's about to be written about in ancient tablets. The Dark Lord also takes a note from the Slayer's chain gun with a shield bash, a not very threatening move in my opinion since it's fairly easy to dodge if you're paying attention, but now he summons two wolves at a time instead of one, and that's the cool thing. As long as you're on top of your hammer game, you can use your hammer to instantly destroy his wolf specters, replenishing your ammo while also recharging your hammer. It's very rewarding. Also, for whatever reason, during the second phase onwards, he's far more vulnerable upon being faltered, letting you combo a few hits in before using the hammer. I like to use the SSG and Ballista, followed up with the lock unburst and frag grenades after the hammer. The experimentation here is a lot of fun for me, trying to min-max as much possible damage in such a small window. And in the chance that you don't have the hammer ready for the wolves, I like to microwave them because of the concussive AoE. I guess you could say that I like my dogs microwaved. Nope, okay, I should probably cut that. And yes, your ears are not deceiving you, the soundtrack is indeed a medley of multiple Doom tracks throughout its history. I'm gonna play you just a few of the reference tracks that I heard, and these are just the obvious ones. I'm sure that there's plenty more than what I've found.
Honestly, all that's missing is the Doom 64 theme, and it would be perfect. I wouldn't be surprised if it's in there. After the second phase, we get a more explicit lore dump for the folks that aren't up to date with their codexes. Tell him. He is the first being, and my creator. When he fell, I ascended. The Dark Lord uses Vega to confirm that he was once the true father, and that Vega, his first creation, usurped his power and title. And for once, we finally get some motivation for why the Dark Lord and Hell is doing what it does. They lie to you, Slayer. Amora and its people would have been perfect. Out of anger to the ones who betrayed him, he vowed that anything made by the False Father's hands will be unmade by his, and all of Hell's armies were merely trying to strip away what Vega had created. As all things were made by my hand, so shall they be unmade, starting with you. Oh, unmake. Let's try the unmaker. Well, that was underwhelming. The BFG does next to nothing as well, which is also pretty stupid, but I guess you could use it against his hordes of demonic specters, which can also be taken out with a single hammer swing. Again, that's kind of underwhelming. He now throws Hell Knight specters at you when he summons his dogs, but because of the absurdly reduced health of these specters, you could take him out with just a few pot shots. Again, if you're on top of your hammer resources, this should be a non-issue, and with enough punishment, the Slayer defeats the Dark Lord atop the Ingmore Sanctum, with Doomguy reasonably wanting to save for the moment, removes his helmet in full view for the first time in several decades, assuming that you count this little close-up window from the classic games, where the Dark Lord, knowing that he's been bested, oh, that's not supposed to be there, asks the Slayer if he has any words for his creator before he strikes him down. Have you nothing to say to your creator before you strike him down? I'm so happy. The Dark Lord is slain, his physical form fatally wounded, and his soul sphere shattered. And with his death, all demons outside of Hell are snapped away. With Doomguy, likely due to the energy of the Dark Lord fading from his system given to him from the Divinity Machine, collapses, being sealed in a coffin by the Seraphs who have been watching over his journey, only to be awakened whenever he's needed again. unless he's fucking dead. I enjoyed this ending. I'm glad that it wasn't all rainbows and happiness, and the ending has genuine consequences for the Doom guy. I'm only saddened that he's not able to enjoy the universe that he spent his whole life fighting for. The ending does come a bit suddenly. It reminds me of a lot of the G-Man endings from Half-Life when Gordon is suddenly ripped away and placed into stasis, and if they want to save the Slayer for a future story, this is a good way to preserve him. Not to mention that we still don't know the beings who created Davoth and so on. So there is still a lot to explore in the Doom universe. We also don't know who the wretch is, which is one of the few characters that I genuinely expected to be fleshed out from this point in the campaign. And now that we know the Dark Lord created the makers who betrayed him, the wretch doesn't even need to be a demon, but literally anyone or any race that betrayed him. I'm eager to see where the Doom series goes from here, but for now, I think the series and Doom Guy has earned its rest. Though I feel like some people have come away with the wrong message from this, mainly regarding the Dark Lord. Well, yes, he was overthrown and banished for wanting the best for his people, which is something I'm sure we can all empathize with, that doesn't exactly mean that he was a good person. I think that this all hinges on whether he knew that making his people immortal would destroy their mind and will. If he did and still strived for immortality, then yeah, he deserved to be cast out. And if he didn't, yes, the Makers and Vega should have communicated this a bit better. But seeing how he reacted with universal genocide? It's like when people said that Thanos did nothing wrong. I loved the Ancient Gods Part 2, but I'd be lying if I didn't say that I wanted it to be a bit harder. This is more of a personal thing, but with part one, I spent nearly two weeks straight checking challenges off of the achievements list and trying to experience everything that it had to offer. With Ancient Gods 2, it was literally three play sessions through Nightmare, Ultra Nightmare, and 1-Up mode. And that barbarian skin you get as a purchase reward for part two probably rubbed some people the wrong way. But I think that saying that part two is actively bad is partially the result of unchecked expectations. People thinking that it would be more than it really was. It's like when people un realistically expect a character to show up in a Marvel property and then saying that it's terrible because their pipe dream never happened. I think that if you see the Ancient Gods Part 2 for what it is, being more levels and a conclusion to the Doomslayer saga, I personally think that it delivers and it's all that I really wanted. 
And then you cut forward in time, and who's waking the Doom Slayer from his coffin? It's the fucking Doom 3 guy! <laughs> 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 <laughs>